our, our moderator and introducer this morning is the infamous Nancy Kander from New York. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Wynne Schwartz is a clinical psychologist in private practice and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He supervises trainee psychotherapists, teaches supervision for the Cambridge Health Alliance. As well, he is on the editorial boards of the American Journal of Psychotherapy and Professional Psychology Research and Practice. He has been a professor in the past at Williams, William James College, the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology, and Wellesley College, and has taught at Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and the Massachusetts Institute of Psychoanalysis. Wynn received his doctorate degree in psychology from the University of Colorado under Peter G. Osorio. Wynn has several publications. However, in, in 2019, he published Descriptive Psychology and the Person Concept, Essent Essential Attributes of Person and Behavior. It was a 2020 American Psychological Association nominee for the William James Book Award. Wynn has trained many students who continue to practice as descriptive psychologists. He also hosts the Boston Study Group every few weeks. And I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our friend and colleague, Wynn Schwartz, this morning. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, good morning. Uh, I wish I could uh, be with you and uh, in Boulder, not expecting the rainstorm that we should get from the uh, remnants of the hurricane. Um, so what I want to talk about today is descriptive psychology uh, and its relationship to the broad practice of psychotherapy. Initially, I had done this, put this together with uh, the idea that it would uh, preface uh, the student presentations, but I'm instead, I think, going to be speaking more directly to, uh, to us, especially us who are old timers here. Many of us have been descriptive psychologists for a very long time. And so what I'm gonna do this morning is just speak to the choir, uh, not sing, because you wouldn't wanna hear that, about things that we all know. So as is our practice, uh, I'm gonna start with Osorio. At some point, Pete offered his psychotherapy supervisees a reminder about their actual task, apart from whatever techniques and therapeutic orientations they were charmed with at the time. And back in the 70s, we were charmed with all sorts of weird stuff. The slogan was, in effect, promise them anything but give them behavior potential. I'm going to return to this when I conclude this morning. But let me start by reminding us what the foundational subject matter of descriptive psychology is actually about. And this is something that I think sometimes is forgotten especially if we mistakenly see descriptive psychology as another psychological theory or a brand of therapy. Descriptive psychology rests on an open conceptual map of the world of persons and their ways, our ways. This is the person concept. This is not the way ordinary psychologies work. I think when I present this to an academic audience, it's usually more immediately recognized in the manner that academics find analytic moral philosophy. More, more so in a form that looks like that branch of analytic philosophy, the personality theory. Descriptive psychology is a subject matter concerned with the pre-empirical conceptualizations of the full range of the possible, rather than a theory that rests on what particular methodologies restrict its empirical. I can't emphasize this enough, nor the fact that this is a very difficult lesson to grasp and a very difficult one to teach, but it's the heart of our subject matter, the non-theoretical, pre-empirical concept of a person. Here's an implication. Although there are therapeutic approaches characteristic of the DP community, there is no descriptive psychology branded therapy, nor should there be. That's not our business. Instead, Descriptive psychology's person concept provides a framework for comparative psychotherapy. Now that said, 
Peter Osorio and Ray Bergner have systematically described policies and practices deliberately compatible with the person concept that are paradigmatic examples of how a person deeply and competently informed by descriptive might conduct non-eclectic psychotherapy grounded in pragmatics rather than theory. I keep this in mind as someone trained in classical psychoanalysis, committed to the ethos of free association in the service of freeing and expanding behavior potential. So let me turn back to the formal nature of descriptive psychology, which is the person concept. I have a slide up, just, it's just a reminder. I'm not gonna go through it in any particular detail, which, but it involves these essential interconnected elements that serve as a map, an unfolding open map, <laughs> open to new terrain, open to reformulation, and it's a map that begins, that has as the interdependent subconcepts, what we mean by the individual person, the paradigmatic case formulation as a method to describe the fact that as persons, paradigmatically, we engage in deliberate action in a dramaturgical fashion. We have the parametric analysis as our tool to make sense of behavior as intentional action. And in its varieties, general intentional action, cognizant action, deliberate action, non-cognizant intentional action. And we have these parameters, the parameters of things that we'll turn to in a, in a bit, just as a reminder. And I'll return to them in near at the end of, the, uh, of my um, presentation this morning. There's language and verbal behavior. And here's where our freedom really resides. And part of it is the reminder that essence is expressed in grammar, a point that Wittgenstein made. The formal possibilities of intentional action can be expressed by the grammars of verbal behavior, including the mathematical and the poetic. This, to the extent that we can use language in all of its various forms, allows access to literally everything in the world. A world of objects, processes, events, concepts, relationships, states of affairs. Interconnected with language and world and behavior are the community of social practices and the culture that gives these social practices a broader coherence. And then there's the world the world concepts of reality and the real world. Now, how is all of this relevant to the practices of psychotherapy? So again, let me start with Pete's concept of pathology, rooted in the person's person concepts, articulation of behaviors, intentional action, and community and culture. This is from Pete's uh, pathology paper. I'll quote, the concepts of a person, personal characteristic, deliberate action, and social practice are substantively central to the, in this respect. And the methodological concepts of parametric analysis and paradigmatic and paradigm case formulation are directly relevant. He sets that up so he can go on to say, when a person is in a pathological state, there is a significant restriction on their ability, A, to engage in deliberate action and equivalently to participate in the social practices of the community. Social practices, forms of life, the structure of community, all of this runs across. And what I'm gonna be concerned about as we move on is um, the social practices of the therapist. But let me, if I have my slides properly set up, which we shall see. Part of the problem central to the, what we tend to work with are problems in self-regulation. The self-regulation that we use as we guide ourselves to engage in the practices deliberately, intentionally, non-deliberately in our communities. And as a sort of, you know, one of the easiest ways to think about at least the model of a practice is agency description. And here we have the familiar parameters of what a person wants, that has a one-to-one -one correspondence to what they might recognize in circumstances, 
what they know, know how to do, the observable performance and achievement that has a significance that can be answered roughly by what the actor is doing by doing this. We can, we can place this in a, in a negative feedback loop, a self-regulation of deliberate action. This is a, a breakdown of the familiar actor, observer, critic feedback loop in which an actor is performing an intentional action that others or oneself can observe cognizantly that we know to some extent, more or less the action that we're performing. We may or may not know that significance. We can generally suss out its significance to us, but the observer may view and have disagreements as the significance. And then the critic who deliberately chooses or corrects the action considering the possibilities. And this is the inherent self-regulation of the negative feedback loop, the self-correction that guides deliberate action. And what this formulation invites is an infinite array of problems to target and practices that might alleviate those problems. The methodologies of parametric analysis and the paradigm case formulation provide a clear way to map and target what is specifically wrong and compare various ways of correcting these problems. One of the things that I've been, I've used this in, in lecture and in teaching uh, and in uh, a variety of publications, has been to show how you can map onto this um, and coordinate different kinds of therapies to work together, the sequence of practices to follow, and what in particular um, a particular discipline may be most interested in. Uh, classically, for example, the psychodynamic therapist is interested in motivation and what the and and the insight and knowledge the person brings, um, but is essentially concerned with significance, what the actor is doing by doing that, what it means. Um, and then in practicing, searching for the meaning and tolerating the meaning is concerned with uh, know-how and competence. This is also directly connected to the humanistic approaches. Uh, coaching in general is gonna focus very much on know-how. The operant conditioner is going to be concerned with manipulating achievements to change performances. Cognitive behavioral therapists tend to be interested essentially in the relationship between what a person wants and knows, but in practicing it over and over again to create better, better performances and in reformulating what a person claims to know or recognizes um, what they believe about what they know in order to find uh, things that have the same significance, but are more, um, but they're more able to effectively, competently act on. DBT, the dialectal behavior therapist, God help us for that name, um, tends to specifically search for methods of know-how that developmentally they believe um, the patient, the client has not developed adequately. And in a community or in an individual session, practice those not yet realize skills until the person can bring them back towards a more self-corrective form. All the ways of treatment that are effective and can be taught, I believe can be mapped onto these, these formulations and as a way to create a better self-regulation. Now, let me talk about my way of doing this. I'm a clinical psychologist. I uh, spent four years of intensive one-on-one -on -one supervision with Osorio. He was my main supervisor. I usually would spend two or three hours at least a week sitting with him talking about whatever, but eventually in supervision talking about cases. And I had 12 years of formal postdoctoral training in classical psychoanalysis at uh, one of the country's two oldest institutes, the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute. All of this is secondary and informative of the knowledge and experience that uh, I've acquired in being an old guy, um, working with couples and individuals and communities. Out of this, I've acquired a kind of favored toolbox. So let me give you a brief list of where, what's in that box. Very brief list, because the box is, is quite large. And as, uh, as Wittgenstein nicely says when he talks about the nature of language and terrain, it has to vary irregularly. It has to function for in all different ways. 
It has to be interchangeable. It has to um, be modified. I think one of the prime understandings that initially informed my work was my understanding the status dynamics of degradation and accreditation, a set of themes that Osorio introduced in meaning and symbolism in a kind of funny way. Uh, Harold Garfinkel's methodology that uh, Osorio studied very carefully when he developed the notion of the degradation ceremony. But these are social practices where a person is judged by self and community as having their eligibility to engage in the valued practices of the community restricted or enhanced. And as a result, their behavior, their behavior potential is restricted or enhanced. In a kind of self-serving comment, my 1979 paper in psychiatry, uh, Degradation, Accreditation and Rites of Passage was I believe the first published reference to status dynamics as such. The degradation and accreditation model, the image of how an engagement can accredit somebody as one of us or as an, a successful enactor of a set of valued principles or to degrade someone, you're not one of us. You're not successful in engaging in the values that you claim are yours or in the, in the values that are central to us as a community. That has served in some ways as a kind of North Star to what we need to be mindful of in each and every therapeutic engagement. I have some other tools that I tend to rely on, especially in teaching. And uh, one of them is what is the um, judgment diagram. Um, that beautiful way to illustrate the relationship between um, the circumstances a person inhabits from their perspective and what reasons they have to act in those circumstances given how they weigh their reasons, given who, what they reckon, I've modified it for, for purposes of uh, specific to psychotherapy and specific to a kind of uh, psychodynamically oriented therapy to remember that um, there are aspects of a circumstance that uh, a person easily recognizes, places where they might be able to deliberate easily or not, but where they might be able to reassign values. And then there's those, that second book of, uh, the one that they tend not to want to open, aspects of circumstances that the actor is reluctant to recognize uh, as personally significant, ones in which they are actually acting in relation to, but will defend against confronting the significance, uh, confronting the significance, and are very, it's very difficult for people to reassign weights to those things that they are reluctant to examine. And this, I think, is in some ways the heart of most psychotherapies is creating some, enough safety and enough of a relational connection that matters where the person feels valued and affirmed that they can risk opening up what they are otherwise reluctant to share. And with that, to be able to create a better feedback loop of self-regulation. The things that we don't look at carefully, things that we're not able to, to acknowledge, tend to remain in a kind of immature, um, rigid, uh, non-negotiated fashion. And that tends to bollocks up self-regulation. And then there is the alleged unconscious. I say that alleged as a psychoanalyst, I'm supposed to be deeply committed to this stuff. But I think the actual engagement with a dynamic unconscious is pretty rare. But hypothetically, theoretically, and occasionally, we run into things that involve something that it looks like the, that are an active feature of circumstance. But the actor is in some ways unable or unwilling. It's hard to tell the two apart. Um, to be able to recognize is personally significant. And in these areas of life, a person finds it very difficult to um, uh, assign the weights, to reassign the weights, to negotiate. There's another feature about these things, which is that generally speaking, those things that a person is unconscious of in the dynamic sense um, tend to be represented more immediately in hedonic and prudent moves, self-defense and, and in sort of gut felt um, hungers, reactions, um, with less aesthetic and less uh, ethical moral features in the weighing, simply because um, ethics, uh, ethics and um, uh, aesthetics generally rest more closely on the ability to deliberate, to assign and to select than um, 
than inherently is the case when we're talking about self-defense, um, prudence, and uh, and hedonics. I make a good a good deal about these kinds of distinctions in my work. Another is the relationship and relationship change formulas. And especially what I think they're most relevant to at least my concerns. And that's the concept of emotional competence. And I think a good deal of what we're concerned about in our, our everyday life is how competent people are in their immediate, um, impulsive, non-reflected actions. How competent are they when they don't have to think something through? And along with the notion of emotional competence is a series of themes. Um, how able the person is to tolerate ambivalence and ambiguity. Uh, the therapist better be able to tolerate ambivalence or ambiguity because so much of what we're going to encounter is uncertain, unclear, not yet well enough defined. How able is a person to tolerate connection to and separation from significant others? What's their, what glues their place in community? How able is a person to immediately assert and behave authentically and spontaneously? Spontaneity is one of the things that the descriptive psychological community is in probably the best position of any of the groups that I know to, to better explore. And the key paper for this is out of nowhere. It's very difficult for people to begin to recognize in traditional psychologies the spontaneous possibility of invention, of doing something new. Generally, we are so concerned about a clear path of cause and effect or of antecedents that until we see how something came from something else, we don't know what to do with it. I think we need a place for spontaneity, for some things that do come, come out of nowhere, so to speak, but come out of our personalities, our recognitions in the immediate presence. It's not often, but when it happens, something new shows up on the scene. And we're performing psychotherapy. We're looking to, to, to establish the possibility of something new, something that hasn't been a broad feature of the person's behavior or of our behavior before. And then there's the qualities of, of empathic sensitivity and compassion and the ability to engage rather than alienate. And on this chart, which you can find in my book and you can find in other so locations, I think in the blog, um, there's a series of theoretical claims based on what we generally believe about the nature of parenting and the nature of deprivation and trauma, what it fosters or elicits, and then emotionally, the kinds of patterns that follow from that. That's not, though, what I want to say mostly with this, this after this morning. What I think is most associated with what we do, with the way that descriptive psychologists are likely to practice, Hydration, very important. What I think is most associated with the way we work follows from appreciating and practicing respect for the I thou dignity of actual people engaged in deliberate action and non deliberate action in a dramaturgical fashion on a real world stage. How do we facilitate the I thou dignity? How do we respect? what we recognize and what we know we're in no position to recognize, but we know has to be there. And I think the best illustrations I have of this come from Ray Bergner's therapeutic policies that I've elaborated a bit from the perspective of Roy Schaefer's analytic attitude. Here's a very abbreviated list, the, the, the list that I tend to work with um, when I teach this formally has about 20 principles. But these, I think, get absolutely to the center of how we do engage when we're engaging with whatever other games we play in the in our practices first and foremost is we regard and treat the client as an agent as a person able to make their own choices that has has their own reasons their own perspective and has um uh we were reminded yesterday, one of the best reminders here is if you call upon a person to do something they can't do or won't do or don't value, they'll do something that they can do, that they do value, that they know how to do. 
you have to regard the person as an agent, which means sometimes we're dealing with herding cats. Um, we're dealing with the fact of the uncertainty of the other person's choices, of the other person's spontaneity, of the other person's recognition of the circumstances given their values. We regard and treat the client as a person who is to be given the benefit of the doubt. Absolutely essential in order to begin a negotiation, to begin a moral dialogue, to begin to help explore a person's set of values, to begin at least as a, unless we have strong reasons otherwise, to treat the person initially as acting in good faith until or unless we have reason to believe they're acting in bad faith. And I use this in the Sartrean notion of good and bad faith, of false consciousness, of the person doing things as a cover for something else in bad faith. Um, the things the person is reluctant to acknowledge. I, we begin by examining what a person is able to say, and what they do believe. With this, we engage the client as an ally and a collaborator. We're trying to form a community, at least of two, a dyad, a triangle, a broader community, where we are acting in accordance to the values that we are developing together the values that are within the framework of the contract of what we have set about to work. A contract that's a movable target, but has to be negotiated before it's changed. What is not to be changed if we're able to do the work is that we're on the client side. But to be on the client side is tricky because we have to, as I think Ray nicely put in, put in his, um, his initial model of this, and that has been central to psychodynamic work from the very beginning is the need to respect all sides of a person's ambivalence. To respect the fact that one of the most difficult things that people have to manage and what they tend to have a great deal of difficulty in revealing, but nonetheless, the odei at hamo, the love and the hate, the, mo the mixed feelings will, will show, are there. And we shouldn't take sides until or unless we see the person being very clear about what they want to move towards and what aspects of their feelings they want to hold in abeyance or to suppress or to be more careful about. We're not neutral. We're never neutral. We're never non-judgmental. But we have to be very careful about our judgments. The notion of analytic neutrality was always a myth. The notion of the non-judgmental therapist is absolute bullshit. We're always making judgments. As we see from the judgment diagram, we have to make judgments in order to act. But what we've learned to do is to be careful about our judgments, to take a deep breath, to wonder where things are going to move. Another, we act with respect and appreciation of the client's ordeal and their possibilities. Life is hard. Hardship. Adversity rarely brings out the best in us. Generally, it makes us mean. It makes us paranoid. It makes us suspicious. On a good day, with the best support, with somebody who has our back, it may bring out the best in us. The best in us is only one of the possibilities. But people come to us in the midst of an ordeal, and they will have an ordeal of sorts in the rite of passage, that may be conducted as they move from a position of troubled values, conflicted values, conflicted life, painful life, empty life, whatever the hell it is, their depression, their anxieties, to a place where they feel safer or more able to self-regulate. We have to reappreciate that they're living through an ordeal and that in that ordeal, we're probably, we're seeing a version of who they are, but not so to speak, the better versions, the best version. We're seeing what they can do or what they believe they can do given the circumstances, which is rarely a full representation of their possibilities. We're not insistent and we're open to surprise. We don't insist on anything. We have a whole paradigm of the unconscious, one of the two paradigms that Osorio provided. There's the unthinkability concept, and there's the insistence concept. 
We can insist things in such a way that other possibilities are not open to, for negotiation or exploration. Part of the heart of the descriptive enterprise of the person concept is the open network of concepts that can be developed, facilitated, replaced, paradigmatically, systematically. If we have a better way of doing something, a clearer way, we can create those replacements. That there's no foreclosure. We have to be open to surprise. We want to be surprised. We also should notice that insistence evokes resistance and defense. We want to model that toleration. In those practices that historically are connected to psychodynamics and psychoanalytic work, existential work, part of our job is to create, to cultivate non-directive free association by inviting non-coerced honesty. We want to make it possible in the service of a person's being able to form new relationships, to form new ways of associating, of connecting, of engaging. We want them to be as free as they can be to represent to themselves and to us what's on their mind. We want to be able to move the um, themes that a person has been reluctant to recognize into something that they're able to talk about and negotiate. So we want to be non-coercive, which means we want to be non-insistent. In doing so, if we to the extent that we're able to, we maintain a zone of safety and toleration. We better be tolerant. And where we're not tolerant, that's when we have to examine whether we can do this work with this kind of person. Um, I've explored this in a piece that will be coming out in American Journal of Psychotherapy soon on um, politics and religion as the third rail of psychotherapy. Those issues of a person's values and actions and directions they want to have want to move into that may be utterly anathema, that may violate the integrity of the therapist itself. What do we do when we are not in a position to tolerate? Um, and in that piece, I make good use of uh, Tony Putman's work on um, worlds in collision. We're in the midst of, a, of what, for all sorts of important reasons, can be described as a culture war. We're involved in all sorts of situations right now that, couldn't, that could very easily involve the end of any kind of small democratic process moving towards authoritarianism, towards fascism in its classic sense. Some of us are willing to go along with that and treat people in a way that respects their rights and feelings about those things, to respect their racism, sexism, what have you. Some of us aren't. Some of us are violated by that and have to make choices as to how we respond. And uh, there are some good guidelines. The most important guidelines is to keep your mouth shut until you know what's going on, to be careful that you can understand things first to practice kindness. With all that in mind, as I'm working, I like to chart my understandings and interpretations on what I begin to learn is dear to my client's ways of life. And this is based on the kind of Anscobian uh, uh, significance descriptions. Uh, the various through lines that describe in character and out of character behavior and action. I'll use that as a way of just mapping the narrative, the dramaturgical fashion, and at least in my way of working, I want to build a coherent narrative that shows historically how a person is, has been working in their world as at least evidence that I'm understanding and following. I also have another checklist, another thing I keep in my pocket. Um, that I found to be quite useful for, for trainees. It comes directly from the intentional action model and involves ways of ways of getting back on track when uh, something's gone askew. I use this as a model um, when I'm doing uh, supervision, because what I want to know, you know, it's all hearsay. I'm hearing what somebody's telling me about somebody else, the plain telephone. 
And I want to have ways of being able to make sure I understand what they're saying, what my supervisee is bringing to me. Uh, I want to be able to see where they don't know something or where we have disagreements. And so I will actually use the general model of intentional action in terms of each of the parameters as the site for inquiry. Um, I can ask these questions of myself when things go askew. Um, uh, or when the person I'm, I'm working with begins to behave in ways that suggest that I'm, I've, I've lost my understanding. Uh, and given my density, I need to remind myself that I only know so much and shouldn't presume to know, to know more. So the questions I'll ask myself when things have gone astray, when, when in the immediacy of the emotional actions, some kind of harmony is gone, when the rhythm of gesture and speech that tends to show we're connected shows a disjuncture, shows a rupture, when I wonder, why are we not on the same page? So I'll ask myself, or I'll ask them, or I'll ask my supervisee, given their understanding of the overall circumstance, what does this person want and value? And do we share an understanding of what the overall circumstance calls for, the W parameter? What exactly do they recognize in their circumstance that is relevant to what they want and value? And do we share a common recognition of the situation, the knowledge parameter? What do they know how to do given what they see as their current opportunity and dilemma? And do they have the skill or competence that is needed to successfully manage the circumstance, the know-how parameter? And what is the significance to them of how they behave in these circumstances? The significance parameter. What personal characteristics are they employing? And what is the significance of these characteristics to them? The personal characteristics and significance parameters. Another is, what is their perspective on how their performance looks? the P parameter and the K parameter. And utterly significant in terms of whether the engagement is empathetic, if the confrontation is empathic, is can they tolerate, do they know how to manage the way I express what I understand about them? Is my understanding one that shows compassion and kindness? The know-how parameter. So let me conclude. Let me conclude. I'm going to conclude. You're not going to let me because I'm here. What can you do? You can turn me off. I'll conclude. Why bother spend a lifetime working this way? I think the answer is because it's deeply satisfying. As Tony Putman explored, satisfaction comes from participation, especially competent, effective participation in the practices a person highly values. Performed as a participant in a community, a person values membership. So let me tell you something I've noticed about therapists that I've supervised, that I've had peer relationships. And by this point, it's, it's a large list. Apart from how good psychotherapists train, I'm talking about the good ones, and we recognize each other. Apart from how good psychotherapists trained, and if lucky, where they found a good community and tradition, where they occupy a place in good standing, the senior therapists who remain deeply engaged easily recognize other traditions and ways of working as making sense. Regardless of where they trained or the theology or theory they hold dear, there is a convergence in the way senior therapists supervise and practice their therapeutic craft. They affirm rather than degrade. They're flexible and improvisational. They are expert in tolerating, acknowledging, and exploring uncertainty. The most useful lesson I try to teach my students and supervisees is that your main job is to become an expert at managing uncertainty, at tolerating uncertainty. By a certain point in their work, the good senior therapists came to recognize how people might change and might not change, given the varied and irregular terrain of their circumstance. They become more like the novelist or the storyteller 
and their freedom to employ the full spectrum of description and explanation. I started this morning with, with promise them anything but give them behavior potential. I'm going, to mo- I'm going to modify the slogan some. What the seasoned, satisfied therapist has implicitly embraced is comfort with the full person concept. All of this is available. They promise to treat clients, patients, and supervisees as persons seeking and needing enhanced behavior potential. They do their best to facilitate that. They have implicitly become descriptive psychologists. We're more than that. To the extent we work within the discipline that Peter Osorio centered on the person concept, our job is to make explicit what others implicitly have come to understand. We have another mission, and that's to never foreclose on possibility. Another of Osorio's reminders was that we do all have our limits. But one of those limits is that we don't know what they are. So thank you. And uh, what are your thoughts? Thoughts, reactions? Kathy Johnston, oh. I want to know more about the third rail, the, the politics and um, religion, how you deal with that. Uh, send me send me an email. I'll send you a copy of the uh, the, the of the pre-publication. Uh, uh, the American Psychiatric Association has got who they own the American Journal of Psychotherapy now as their flagship journal for psychotherapy are um <laughs> they have difficulties with with people getting getting parts of them who aren't subscribers but if you want to see that this paper send me an, an email there's also a blog posting in my blog about uh, politics and religion the third rail of psychotherapy that has a broader um uh, less edited version of the of the theme but if you send me a, a, an email i'll send you send you the paper it's uh and when it's formally published i'll be able to which should be the next edition i'll send uh I'll send out copies, but you know, essentially the issue is is that um, we're supposed to treat each other as uh, you know wacky and hazardous or wonderful and correct beliefs uh, with dignity and respect. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes the positions of their ideology or belief system is anathema to our own existence. And more and more often, they show up in our consulting rooms. This is an issue. It's become a big issue in supervision. So. uh, Okay, we have a couple of raised hands. So CJ, I think, is first, and then Marty Smith. So uh, thanks so much, uh, Wynn. Uh, Really great. This This is, once again, a really clear very tight account uh, that a person can work from. I mean, you can use this. You know, I found it a great reminder. Like you said, you're preaching to the choir. You know, we can use reviews. We can use uh, somebody going over it and stringing it together again, where where the, the connections sort of get fuzzy and you kind of forget if you haven't traveled that connection, it kind of goes away like an old memory. And, and you've strung it together again for us. And that was really good. It was down to the nub of all this. Um, with the major descriptive landmarks put right out there in a really practical way on those slides and those lists of the policies and, and so on. You know, you're clearly a master at teaching this. Uh, you know, and, and right now, as well as like in the book and uh, the blog and all that, anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Wynn. It's just thank great you. work. Thank you. Um, right. so a, a piece that I'm going to be working on on vacation uh, involves <laughs> some ch- cultural changes that people have been uh, com- have been noticing, at least the people I've been working with. And for lack of a better term, I'm calling it the uh, uh, 
satisfaction uh, versus uh, grievance ratio, um, the gratitude versus um, a, a grievance ratio that seems to have been modified more and more in terms of the, of the degree of occupation of our awareness with the things we're satisfied with, the things we appreciate, the things we're thankful for versus our grievances. And that I've been using as a kind of general model. So the feeling that I might've done something that is appreciated is deeply appreciated. Thank you. All right, Marty Smith. Um, I'm, I'm, I agree with CJ, that was a great, great presentation. Um, I am, as I've said repeatedly, um, not an Osorian uh, expert or, uh, and I wasn't a, a, a respected Osorio enormously, but I was not an acolyte during my graduate time. Um, and I, we talked, I think, uh, when Ian was talking about getting a, uh, a language, uh, to a general language that people could understand uh, in terms of Osorio, uh, Osorio's thinking. Um, I, am, I am not expert in that, but I will say, um, and I was uh, psychodynamically, psychoanalytically trained. Um, uh, all of this made enormous sense to me. Um, it was, uh, it, it, it was a very, it, it made sense to me intuitively. It made it sense to me in terms of my sense of the world, in terms of my sense of my experience in doing therapy. Um, so that uh, it just it it just came in and made sense. Um, it it reminded me in terms of um, understanding the person and the whole person um, and and the task in doing that. But when uh, when Joe was talking about the figure ground thing um, in Buddhism, and we're talking about the ground, you know, you take in everything, um, every possibility, the whole universe of things, um, as you as you connect with the person, uh, or try to connect with the person, and and you talked about that in terms of accepting the whole person, which is an Osorian concept, but it's also plain language at the same. So it's it, it's it's Great. The other thing that I had, uh, I, I, uh, and I didn't do formal training in an institute. I was trained by people from institutes, but, but I'm not formally trained uh, from an institute. But I had a, um, in the course of my training, I had a wonderful um, analyst uh, who, who was um, a supervisor of mine. Uh, for three years, um, and he talked about um, in terms of schools of therapy and all that. It was, it's a little simplistic or binary, but he said there are two types of therapists. Um, there are good therapists and bad therapists, um, and that was his sense of um, uh, how to understand schools of therapy and all that. You're a good therapist or you're a bad therapist, um, and Good therapists do similar things and bad therapists do similar things. And I think they're mediocre therapists also. So I'll add a third category. But anyway, thanks so much. It was, that was great. Thank you. So I want to uh, throw out a question. I know there's a couple of other hands up, but I, I have a question for the group. So um, when has here in his, um, in his little description of what he's gonna be talking about, Although there are therapeutic approaches and ways of talking characteristic of the DP community, there's no descriptive psychology branded therapy, nor should there be. Instead, there's a comparative uh, framework for comparative psychotherapy. And uh, what we have are pragmatic examples of how a person uh, might conduct therapy. So um, we, do, we do know, as he said, that really good therapists do a lot of the same things, including uh, probably a lot of the things that he put down there. But do people agree that there's no um, DP branded therapy? Yeah, David. Right. David Bender. Mary Roberts tells me that uh, there are people licensed to practice as clinical psychologists in the state of Colorado as status dynamic therapists, not as descriptive psychology therapists, but status dynamic therapist. And of course, we all know there's no difference there. Uh, 
uh, Charlie Cantor. Hey, Wen. Hey. Um, last year, when we, I think we were talking about this kind of thing um, at some point uh, between sessions, and it occurred to me that throughout my 40 year time as a psychotherapist, people would say, So, what kind of therapy do you do? And I would start to say, uh, uh, status, uh, uh, well, you wouldn't know what it is, but go look at the Wikipedia thing. And it's a nice description. Um, and then it hit me when we were talking about it, that what I really should have said was, can I change your question? And the change would be, uh, can I tell you how I help people? And it occurred to me then, and, and thinking more about this, and this is why I think when is really important saying this, is that, um, in the US of A, and maybe a lot in the world, uh, therapy is seen as a kind of medication. It's particular, it's supposed to be for kind of particular. And to have legitimacy, it has to have a certain kind of, of set of things that you can say is this is one kind of medicine over here, this is psychotherapy A, and this is another kind of medicine over here, psychotherapy B. And what we know about psychotherapy is that's uh, the road to hell, because you're gonna then start trying to make your clients fit into your medication as opposed to the other way around. And so I think thinking of it, this is how we help people. Um, and, and, and I think when articulates this much more broadly, but that's what it occurred to me. And it just clarified it to me for sure. Well, CJ just posted something that I think is another way of going about this, which is that uh, descriptive psychology can be seen as a therapy for therapies. Um, uh, in the sense that it provides a map to um, identify the, the range of therapies. The fact, I, you know, we're talking about branded is just, you know, I, I obviously have some issues with that. Um, but I think it's part of the dilemma is that given that Osorio just happened to find himself at a, a, as a teacher of clinical psychologists, many of us have developed manners of work that um, bear a good family resemblance to how we watched his work, given his thoughts, and that that has become in some fashion what's been expanded in what uh, I think Ray is um, nicely calling just uh, status dynamic psychotherapy. I'd argue that all therapies are status dynamic psychotherapies, but that what Ray has been explicit about is something that makes use of the full set of concepts. So if we wanted to give it a brand name, I wouldn't mind that, but I, I have some philosophical problems with uh, with uh, with doing that because it then begins to confuse us with a particular set of social practices, and when you read the um, the kinds of literature, especially a lot of raised literature, there is a very stylized form of work that um, uh, that you know privileges some some ways of engagement over others, and I think well, and that's part of the issue that I have. Uh, Walter Torres, um, thank you, Win. I echo CJ's uh, comment. Um, and uh, Charlie, I very much appreciated that formulation of changing someone's question. Um, and about the person who, who was it that said about bad therapists, good therapists, a supervisor at Massachusetts General Hospital told me I was among the worst two therapists he had ever supervised. So anyway, I have, the, I have that distinction. Um, um, uh, you, you made a quip about dialectical behavior therapy. And, and this is just a very brief question on that. I have, I have another question after that, but you made a very brief quip about, about that term. And I couldn't tell if it was negative or positive. Uh, what, 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 what is your comment on it? It's just a, just a dialectical behavior therapy. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? Um, it's, you know, it's why people call it DBT. And they don't worry about what, what, what the initials stand for anymore because it's an extraordinary array of practices that Linehan, in particular, in, in noticing her own pathologies, brilliantly wondered, what do I lack in order to effectively engage as a person with other people in order to tolerate life? And she systematically began to look at, I didn't have this, I didn't have that, and maybe it became from here, maybe it came. So these are the things I need to practice in order to develop my capacity to engage in the world. And what I see in the community of people that, that do um, DBT is that they've developed beautiful systematic manners of engagement where people can practice the things that they haven't practiced adequately yet. And they practice them 
long enough, hard enough, and if they succeed, um, they end up with vital skills needed for to be emotionally competent. And um, that's a pretty wonderful thing. Yeah. I also remember about 20, 30 years ago, uh, the way in which this society, and I was one of the particular members, abused one of our members who had just come from studying with, with Linehan about, uh, the, about DBT, and in particular about the methodology of once a person doesn't agree with the manner of not allowing them to remain in the group, which, which upped the ability to create better statistics, but also okay. enabled that community to learn what actually worked. Um, the use of abandonment, which is one of the crucial uh, horrors of the borderline, was used as a deliberate way to, to coerce the borderline to agree. Um, but many of them got thrown out, which for better or for worse, and we gave the person a horrible time, which we shouldn't have. We ate a lot of our young back then, and that's why now we're a bunch of old folk. Um, okay, the uh, um, actually, but but that's a helpful comment on DBT. And I'm working with a narcissistic personality, and I realize that that's the the gist of what I'm doing. Uh, but it's a good reminder that I might want to tap into that more systematically. Um, then the, the uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, oh, you talked about the most difficult um, uh, transition of engagement when you are introducing the person concept, uh, the conceptual system of persons and behavior, essentially descriptive psychology. When you when you begin to introduce this overall scheme, this this approach. You said that there are some particularly difficult transitions there in terms of getting something across, getting somebody, getting somebody to get it, to move with you. Could you talk about that, please? Yeah, you know, I'll start. I interrupt for just one second. So we are almost at the end, and we have a we have a short morning. I wonder if people we have two raised hands we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, would people be okay with an extra 10 minutes and then a 10 minute break and starting at uh, 10, 20 instead of, so we have a little time for discussion. Yeah, is T on? Yeah, is-, is... You, you couldn't hear me, but that's fine with me. Okay, and if that's okay with everyone, because discussion is, it's so good. Okay, so when try to also keep in mind that we have only 10 minutes and we've got a couple of people that really would like to get in as well. So very, very quickly, um, the distinctions that I'll start with would be that a conceptualization is a range of, of all of the possibilities that work within the concept. Um, and we have a conceptualization of persons uh, as deliberate actors who engage in you know, dramaturgical fashion, et cetera, um, that allows us to get the full range without talking about a particular person. Um, the point of a conceptualization is to map out a subject matter. Once you have a map of a subject matter, then you can go out and look at see what actually happens, what forms that subject matter begins to take empirically. Once you have a collection of the, of the examples, then you're in the position to do theory, which is why is it of all the possibilities, only certain possibilities under these circumstances are likely to show up. And from that, we might make predictions or expectations if we do this, the new possibilities. So the distinction begins with a conceptualization of the subject matter that then serves as our guide for searching the world, for how those things are instantiated, how they show up, what actually happens. Once we have a whole variety of examples, then that's where theory becomes useful, which is why is it this set of examples and not other ranges? And after I explain people that to people, they say, well, that's a really interesting theory. <laughs> All right, we have uh, Charles Cote and then Errol. Yeah, I've, I've been part of um, the society for, th this is my third year, I think. And I just want to say that not only does uh, a descriptive conceptualization help with enhancing behavior potential for, um, for a client, but for a therapist too. And I, I would say that my experience has been over the last three years that my behavior potential as a therapist has been enhanced. My ability to sit with uncertainty um, and to practice those policies and, and uh, just have another way of conceptualizing um, what's actually happening has been just fundamentally 
transformative in my own experience as a therapist. So I just want to express gratitude. And I like the way that you summarized all that one. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. All right, Errol. Hi, great talk. I just wanted to um, bring up a question about the AOC feedback loop slide that you brought up earlier, Wynn. And um, I'm wondering how that plays out therapeutically when you have a client uh, I, that may already present with certain higher functioning regions of interpersonal relationships or um, they have a high stress job or something that they're doing quite effectively, but they're struggling in a different area. Um, how do you utilize that kind of a feedback loop in therapy to sort of look at, you know, exceptions to self-concept stuff? I don't know. How would you do it? Well, I mean, you, you had some good sort of examples of questions that might be helpful. I'm thinking when someone is trying to interpret either their own behavior that they don't understand or behavior in other person's under, uh, behavior that they don't understand. But what I'm wondering is if there are ways that you find helpful to kind of teach a process of recursive um, reflection as a way of kind of regulating a system that's otherwise prone to get stuck in a spinning wheels kind of a phenomenon in certain areas. Do you ever kind of borrow the traction of a different area of uh, that? refers to two great moral philosophers, uh, Sarah Palin and um, Ronald Reagan. Reagan's famous, um, there you go again, and Palin's, how's that working for you? I mean, that's one way you can confront. Uh, you can describe. You can wonder about, you know, how a particular way of, of going is uh, is serving their, their purposes. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, there's an infinite array of... of dealing with somebody and wondering uh, as um, uh, the observer critic of the observer critic, um, the question of, as I'm thinking about what you're telling me, I'm wondering what other ways you might've gone about it or what decisions were you making? The goal is always to sort of open the field of possibility uh, to offer new possibilities, to show patterns and to wonder um, uh, what might be an alternative. What are the alternatives that are available to them given their understanding. What's in their awareness of the alternatives as well? What should they notice that they, you know, that's there to note? But the other feature primarily is to deal with the stuff that is, um, the stuff that we talk about, you know, in, in class about the domain two, the areas that a person is reluctant to recognize as an active part of their circumstance. That's where the main hard work is, is create enough safety so that people can risk um, trying to talk about what, what's going on in them, what they're reluctant to look at. The, um, the two sets of books image, the book that we opened to everybody and the book that we hope the IRS never gets a hold of. Comments, questions? I suggest we say thank you to Wynn.